A listener's note. The following episode contains coarse language, adult themes, and content of a violent and disturbing nature, and may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Depending on where you live, whether it's a big city, a rural community, or anywhere in between, hopefully you consider it to be a safe place for you. I've been reporting on crime for nearly 25 years and consider my home city to be relatively safe, especially compared to places like Detroit that has a homicide rate that's nearly 10 times as high as Calgary. What I've learned is that regardless of where you live, bad things can happen anywhere. Mylan has walked the, walked the streets of Detroit for years and never had never had a fiery dart thrown at him to the point where it cost him his life. Could have been any one of us that night. I think the dude was just looking for somebody that he could get to. That particular night, he just ran to the devil. I'm Nancy Hickst, a senior crime reporter for Global News. Today, on Crime Beat, a young man who beat the odds to become a professional football player, only to have that dream suddenly shattered. This is Blindsided, the Mylan Hicks story. In the fall of 2016, the Canadian Football League season was well underway, and the Calgary Stampeders were on fire. Their game on September 24th of that year was particularly important. It was, it was a lot on the line. It was a lot of history on the line. It was a lot of pride on the line. It was a lot of bragging rights. That's Derek Dennis. He's a former NFLer and a CFL All-Star player. In 2016, he was an offensive lineman for the Stampeders, the team most fans simply call the Stamps. It was two of the top teams in the West Division. It was us and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and we were playing for first place in the West Division. Both of us were coming in off of um, win streaks, so I think they were on a nine-game win streak. We were on a ten-game win streak, and whoever won that game would have continued their hot streak as the hottest team in the league and claimed first place in the West outright to get a chance to kind of host the West Finals. So. He's got enough. I'll never forget that game for a multitude of reasons because it's probably one of the biggest games of my career and probably one of the biggest days of my life in, in the sense of, of what occurred that day. Before we get into what happened that day in September, I need to take you across the U.S. border to Detroit, Michigan, where this story begins. It's where Mylon Hicks was born and raised. Here's his mother, Renee Hill. Here in Detroit, it's a beautiful place. Um, it has its segments of crime like any other place, but it also have, has its segments of, you know, oneness, uh, togetherness, community, where people look out for one another. Mylan was the middle child of five siblings. I was pretty stern in uh, raising my children. They weren't allowed to just roam the streets. I had to know where they were. Quan Williams was one of Mylan's best friends since kindergarten. My mom and his mom, they were on us from the beginning since we were little. Like, oh, you can go here, you can't go there. Watch who you're around, watch who you talk to, don't talk to strangers. Just always make sure y'all know each other at and things like that. So we definitely took care of each other. Mylan's mom said that from the time he could walk, he had a drive that was unstoppable. His journey was always different because he just was one who went after everything. Anything that he set his sights on, he had no fear. His tenacity was excellent. He just, he, he wasn't a quitter. He just kept moving from place to place. At the age of three, he was riding a two-wheeler. Uh, he blew my mind. I came home from work. He had a little bike with training wheels. I don't know who he convinced to move, to remove the training wheels, but he come down the street, this big old head and some little shorts and no shirt. I got out the car, I was like, is that my child? Then I realized he was flying. He did everything fast. He moved so quickly and he flew past me and I realized that was my son. I was like, Mylon, get back here. He burned rubber real quick. He came back three years old. I said, you don't have training wheels. 
he shook his big head no and he won't see well had already seen but he just got on that bike so I think it started there I think the realization that he was just uh, a real fearless individual would champion anything anything he set his sights on that he was a go-getter Mylan also had a tender heart. At the age of four, I taught him how to um, give back to the community. To uh, the matter of fact, she still lives across there. She's uh, we call her mother. Her name is Miss McCauley, Lillian McCauley. She's a hundred and I want to say two. And at the age of four, I taught Mylan when you clean up our yard you go across the street and you clean up Miss McCauley's yard. And you would catch him at the age of four, walking to the curb, looking both ways, and he would shoot across the street. I said, where are you going? He said, I gotta clean up your yard. And he would go right across there without assistance. He looked both ways. He picked up the paper and then it went from that to pulling out her trash can every Monday. And he did that faithfully, all the way up and throughout college. Growing up, he was interested in every sport imaginable. Basketball, soccer, hockey, swimming, and of course, football. We put him in everything in order for him to carve out his best. Come to find out, it was all his best. The crowd would just cheer him on, and I would look around in awe and proud that all of these people were there, even though their children were there, their sons, they was just rooting, my land, my land. And I think that just did it me, and he would just score a touchdown, and he always had this, uh, you know, after he did it. <laughs> Little fat fingers, and he'd run back across the field. Yeah, he was, he was an amazing kid. Mylan eventually set his mind on being a football player. He shared his hopes and dreams with his closest friends. Some were more like brothers including Lawrence Thomas. We talked about going to the NFL basically our whole life, like throughout high school, just dominating the um, game in high school, then getting to the next level in college and actually winning a couple of Big Ten championships, Rose Bowl championship, Cotton Bowl championship, just being a part of an amazing program to seek the next step, which is the NFL, and that was our journey. His dream started to come true, just like he and Lawrence had planned. Their first stop, Michigan State. His time with the university team, the Spartans, wasn't an easy ride. The first few years were plagued with injuries, but Mylan didn't give up. He sat on the sideline and he perfected, he perfected his game and he watched other people move. And I remember one time, he wasn't talking to me, but I heard him talking to someone and he was saying, it ain't so bad on the sideline because everybody revealed a mess out there, and I I pick up on it. So when I do get out there, I already know they moved because I've studied them. He took a bad and made a good out of it. He didn't just focus on the game. Mylan also prioritized spending time with family and helping others. I remember him attending school in Michigan State, and I went up there one time. He turned me on to this chicken shack. We both love chicken. I think he loved it more than I. And when I got up there, he named the chicken crack. Now, you know, crack is a drug here. And I was like, crack? What do you mean crack? He's like, let me take you to get some. He goes, ma, it's chicken. He said, it's so good, it'll keep you coming back. You know, he related it to a drug. I was like, boy, I was finna beat that. You know what out of you. (laughs) So we got some chicken and there was this little young lady. She was in her pajamas, pajama pants. And she had her sign held up, we'll work for food. Well, we have those same people here on every corner. Some of them, some of them really do need it and mean it. And some of them don't. So she's holding a sign up. My son abruptly slams on brakes. I said, what are you doing? He wanted to hand her some money. I said, Mylan, what are you doing? He's like, ma, he said, you always say if I do it from my heart, I don't have to worry about whether she do the right thing with it. By his senior year, Mylan won the award for most inspirational player. Here he is speaking in an interview for the Michigan State Spartan Sports Network. 
I made uh, I actually graduated in psychology uh, this summer. And how'd you feel about that? How'd that I mean, it was a great accomplishment. Of course, my parents was happy, and uh, I just felt like it was another achievement that I. Um, or another goal I knocked off in my life. And of course, I went through my hard times here, but, you know, my uh, testament to my parents and my faith in God, you know, I just, try, I just try to stay hungry and quitting wasn't an option for me. His dream to go pro was a bit of a roller coaster. He got calls from a few NFL teams, but nothing panned out until the San Francisco 49ers signed him to their practice roster. And he went out there and he was happy. He loved the weather. He loved the ambiance. He said he loved the people. He just did not love not being on the, ha- having cracked the team yet. But he was willing to try. So they got rid of whatever their process is. He made it through almost to the end and then he got cut. And that's where the backup plan come from to route him through the CFL. Mylan seized an opportunity with the Canadian Football League. He saw it as a way back to the NFL. I didn't know much about Calgary. I just looked at Canada, not the, um, not the different parts of it. I just looked at Canada as a whole. And that that I had heard about Canada had always been good, had always been great. So I gave my son his blessing because he was pursuing his dream. He signed with the Calgary Stampeders in May of 2016, once again as part of the practice roster. His mother talked to him every day. He knew that the steps that he was taking would lead him back to the ultimate dream, and these were just stumbling blocks or hurdles, you know, that he had to cross, but he was willing to cross them to get to where he wanted to be. Derek Dennis knows that feeling very well because he's lived it. That goal to get back to the NFL is always what every American guy who comes to the CFL is aiming for. I mean, we all, uh, most of the guys that come up there have some sort of stint in the NFL um, or have been there previously in some capacity in like a practice squad or all-season roster spot. So it was always an aspiration, especially, you know, growing up here in the States, that's always been the goal for your football players to make it to the NFL, right? And the CFL has always been uh, somewhat of a springboard for a lot of American guys to get up there, get some game time film, uh, get something to, you know, kind of put on a resume that send it to NFL teams and get that, that shot that they covered. So I'm originally from Queens, New York, uh, born and raised. Uh, ended up being a pro football player for about eight years, eight, nine years. Dennis was an offensive lineman for the Calgary Stampeders during the 2015 and 2016 seasons. Mylan was a rookie when they met. Normally in the, in the locker room, especially in Calgary, they put a bunch of like uh, movable stalls in the middle of the locker room for the new guys coming in. And uh, Mylan was actually one of the guys that was right in front of me. So it was, it was always like three lockers right in front of where my locker was. And it was, uh, it was Mylan and, uh, and two other guys. And so I um, got a chance to kick it around Mylan a little bit, get to know him. You know, I was like the, the resident DJ at the locker room. So I used to always get the music requests to play all the songs guys wanted to hear. And, you know, Mylan always wanted to hear like some, some, some stuff that was, that was, you know, what he was used to, man. It was actually, we had the same taste in music. I remember one day, um, I just like kind of went on just playing my own music and just kind of vibing out and getting the locker room in a certain mood. And I remember, um, you know, him coming up to me and be like, yo, what you know about this song? Like, oh, what you know about this? Like, yo, yo, you got the locker room turned up. And I was like, yeah, you know, that's that's me, man. You get double D, you get to know me. And that's that's kind of how, how we kind of moved from there. Because Mylan was on the practice roster, he wasn't playing games. But Derek Dennis said he was still a huge part of the team. And I know Mylon was always one of those guys who was um, very big in the community. And even though he wasn't making a lot of money, he didn't let it phase him, man. He always felt like he was blessed and he always wanted to give those blessings to other people. And he was always just an energetic guy, man. I remember always talking about him every day in practice that he played the game with like such a passion and such a fire that it was kind of contagious and it, it rubbed off on a lot of people. Even though he wasn't on the field, he would be the guy on scout team giving the offense the, the absolute best looks. He would be out there picking the ball, even though they told him not to. He would be flying around acting like he was, he was just, he, he just got us ready for every game, man. He was a big part of that team. I mean, when you see guys like that, when you surround around a, a locker room full of guys like that, man, it just, it, it creates a recipe for success. So I think that's why we were having such a good year and why we were doing so well. Mm-hmm. 
September 24th, 2016 started out like any other day for Mylon Hicks. He talked to his older sister Jasmine and her boys, who loved their uncle. Yes, we FaceTimed every day and while he was in Calgary, so he could talk to the boys. Our last little conversation, he was actually on his way to practice, and he had this big, bright smile on his face. Mylan's mother, Renee, was at a cheerleading championship with his little sister, but she made sure to talk to her son before the big game. But it was so short. The conversation was so short. But Mylan stayed on my mind that day. Headed into game time, the Stamps were on the verge of setting a new team record with another win. Here again is Derek Dennis. We had one of the best records in CFL history and we was keeping it going, so it was, it was a lot on the line. Here we go. The snap, the spot, the kick by Paredes, drives it, it's going, it's going, it's going! unbeaten streak in 68 years. Woo, what a sensational finish on a game-winning drive by Rene Paredes. The Matador strikes for the Calgary Stampeders. Oh, my golly, the White Horse rides on again on an absolutely sensational end of the ball game, and that'll do her. The Calgary Stampeders head to the dressing room victorious. It was such a significant win, the players celebrated at the Marquee Beer Market. As you can imagine, professional football players tend to stand out wherever they go. A lot of them are big guys, including Derek Dennis, who's six foot three and about 350 pounds. It was a lot of people in there. It was a packed club. You know, it was kind of like shoulder to shoulder. So wasn't a lot of room to maneuver and get around. So just naturally, you know, when you're in a crowded place, people are going to bump into each other. People are going to, you know, rub, you know, rub elbows, whatever, you know, whatever it may be. An accidental brush and a spilled drink. That set the tone for the rest of the night. It was just one of those situations where uh, Renee somehow, you know, bumped a guy, spilled his drink. You know, he, he apologized for it, offered to buy him a new one. Guy was just getting all, you know, kind of irate, like, yo, you spilled my drink, what's your problem? Like, who do you think you are type of thing? And it was more like a, yo, dude, like, calm down. It's it's not really that deep. Like, I didn't mean to bump you. I'll buy you another one type of thing. You know, I'll buy you or whoever else you want to drink. I don't know if they took it as, like, a disrespect thing. Like, oh, you're trying to show you got more money than me? Or, like, I don't know what it is. But it just just really started over nothing, something that could have been easily, you know, resolved. And uh, I remember standing there with a couple teammates. We saw the uh, commotion coming from it. And we all know Renee's a, Renee's a cool guy. Renee's not nobody who wants trouble. He's not a fighter. He's not a, you know, he was in there with his girl. We, we, we all took, took it as a sense of, hey, not just to protect him, but protect his wife as well. You know, it's a female right there. So we don't want nothing to happen where she gets injured or anything like that. Derek Dennis is referring to Renee Paredes, the Stamps kicker who got the winning field goal. Dennis said it seemed these guys were looking for trouble. Guys started to get a little rowdier. Wanted to prove a point that they were, you know, just as tough or manly or whatever you want to call it. You know, testosterone, egos, whatever, whatever you want to call it, started flaring. Next, there was an incident between Dennis's roommate, former Stamps running back Jerome Messam, and these guys. He was kind of like being there to be a protector, but he was egging it on in a sense, like a, like a, yo, you're a little dude, you're not gonna do nothing, like stop acting like you're tough. And I guess to prove a point, to show him that he wasn't tough, he took his hat off his head and he put it on his head. And then he was wearing his hat, like, you know, if you want your hat back, come get it. And the dude was kind of like, like, oh, you disrespected me. And then that's when it started to build from there. Dennis said there were three men involved a taller one that wore a white t-shirt and a red vest, a second shorter guy who wore a white Armani Exchange hat, the one Dennis just mentioned, and a third guy. I remember he had a white polo shirt on and a, and a, and a hat, like a strap back hat. He was just um, just like running up like, yo, what y'all wanna do? You wanna go outside? You wanna handle this? And it was like a, 
yo, it's, that's not what it is right now. And he just wouldn't let it go. He just kept like kind of running around frantically. You'll remember that Derek Dennis is from Queens, New York. And he felt that the third guy was giving off signs that he was trouble. So, you know, in my head, where I'm from, when someone says that, it's kind of like a, it's like a catchphrase you hear in movie stuff, like, oh, I'm gonna go pop the trunk type of thing. Like, so in my head, I'm thinking, all right, if he's telling us to go outside, that means he's trying to get to something that he feel like he can use. Cause if it was really, if he really wanted to fight, he would have done it right there on the spot. For a lot of us who come from the U.S. and come from, you know, certain socioeconomic economic backgrounds where we, we grew up with that, we kind of understood, you know, what he was trying to do. Dennis had a very bad feeling and thought the Stamps group should leave. But not everyone was ready to call it a night. Naturally, I'm an offensive lineman, so I'm a protector. That's, that's my mindset. I, I want to make sure everybody's good. I want to make sure everybody gets home at the end of the night. Mylon Hicks was in the bar all night, but he was nowhere near the commotion. No, Mylon was actually in the back of the club. It was, uh, it was like a table area by the wall, by the stage. He was over there with a couple of other dudes, um, his roommate mainly. Throughout the night, Mylon was messaging with NFL player Lawrence Thomas, his friend from back home. What's crazy is um, the day that it happened, I had a game that Sunday against the Kansas City Chiefs. And I woke up in the middle of the night and um, he had sent me like a Snapchat of just him just in the club, just having a good time. You know what I'm saying? Just letting them know they just won a game. And then I had woke up in the middle of that night, like around like 2.30 in the morning. And I seen like, okay, he having a nice time. Dennis was driving that night. So he ducked out of the club before many of his teammates. I had walked out early to go get my car. And I told dudes, I'm like, hey, as y'all leave, you know, make sure round everybody up. Make sure who who's who is where they need to be. And I'm going to get my car. I'm going to pull up and whoever's out front, then, you know, get in and we're going we're gonna to go go about our business. I'm going to make sure whoever need to ride home, get home. I actually saw Miley when I was walking out the club and I said, hey, you good? You need to ride home? Like, you got to be like, yo, Double D, I'm straight. I don't need a ride. I'm good. I'm like, you sure? I got my car. You know, you can get in the car and get a ride. He's like, nah, we good. He was with a couple other dudes. He's like, you know, we good. We going, you know what I'm saying? Do what we do. So I said, all right, I mean, y'all boys get home safe. You know what I'm saying? Let me know if you need me type of thing. And um, yeah, that was the last time I spoke to him. That was the last conversations I, I had with him before, before everything happened. Dennis said he heard a bottle break. It startled him. He opened his door to see what was happening when he heard a gunshot. I froze and I looked around and I'm like, who the hell is shooting in Calgary? Like, who has a gun? Like, it's like, like you said, in our mind, we're not thinking there's no type of crime. People are not walking around with guns. We're not thinking any of that. So <laughs> that I remember that distinctly. The first thing went to my head was who the hell has a gun and is shooting in Calgary? So I survey around me to see like, like where the gunshots was coming from. And then that's when I see Mylon running towards me. It happened so quick and I felt like I was moving in slow motion. As I go to get out the car to rush him, that's when I see him shoot two more shots. So I, so I see him go bang. I, I look, I see Mylon stumbling by me, trying to get his, um, so his car is parked on the side, it's my car. It's like a space between it. Mylon's trying to dart into that space to run. So I see him stumble. When I see him stumble, I see the, I, see, I see, watch him let off another shot, bang. And then that's when I saw Mylon fall, hit the ground face down. So me, I'm like, I'm like, oh, oh, sh I gotta get to him. So I'm trying to rush him. After he let the second shot off, I see the guys come. They're like, yo, come on, get in the car. They, they grab him, they put him in the car, they speed off. So I start chasing the car, trying to like get a license plate, see whatever. I'm like trying to run after the car. So when I can't catch the car, I start screaming. I'm like, I'm like, yo, they shot him, they shot him. Everybody's running around. I'm like, yo, they shot Mylon. So then I run back over to where he is. Now a couple of teammates had already, you know, rushed over there. So when I run back over, we like, yo, Mylon, get up, get up. We all trying to, you know, make sure he good. I, re I remember, um, I remember, damn, I, re I remember grabbing him and flipping him over and we opened his vest, we opened his shirt and I saw the bullet hole in his chest and I just started like, I just freaked out. I was like, I was like, oh, like, in my head, I just started praying. I was like, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. But I'm like frantic, I'm running around. 
I'm trying to make sure they're not going to shoot nobody else. I'm trying to see where the car went. Everybody's like running around frantic. I mean, I know people say they, they know what it feels like to have a broken heart, but like I literally felt like, like I could feel the, the chest pain from like, well, like watching him, see him like that. And I just, I just remember being like so frantic and so angry and, and so lost. Like I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to help him. I was like scared for him. Like it was, it was just like a wave of emotions that I just, I didn't know what to do. And all I could think about was like, while I'm going through all these emotions, I'm just praying like, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. Like I, I was just hoping that I got a chance to go to the hospital and see him again. Dennis has replayed the moment Mylan got shot over and over in his head. It was like a, it was like a scene out of a movie. Like it was so surreal. Like I'll, I have nightmares about that, about that to this day. Like, like that, that thing stuck with me so crazy that like, I don't even think my, my mental is the same anymore after like seeing that. And I remember just watching him on the ground, just like, like breathing, but I, his breathing was getting slower and it was getting slower. And it was like, you could tell, like he was struggling to, 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 to get his hair. And we was all just like, yo, Mylon, hold on. Like, you know, the ambulance is coming, like screaming, call 911. And I just remember like the, the police showing up, they all came out with like these big AK guns and stuff and they pointing the guns at us and I'm screaming like, yo, they, they, they shot out, they shot out our, our teammate. Like help him, help him. Like don't try to, you know, don't mess with us. Not, we ain't do nothing, like help him, like help him. So yeah, after that, you know, they like pulled me to the side and they like started questioning me. And then, you know, the last time I saw Mylon was when they, when they got him on a stretcher and they put him in the back of the ambulance and that was the last time I ever saw him. There were multiple calls to 911 at about 2.30 in the morning. Constable Chad Roche and his partner were working the night shift in downtown Calgary. When we pulled up, EMS was still there and they were still with the victim on the side of the building. And so we had officers that were trying to kind of control the scene and um, we were trying to locate, identify witnesses who'd kind of tell us what happened. Not really clear at the start what had really happened. The parking lot was full of people. Like everyone that had been inside the club was out in the parking lot and people were, uh, people were crying, people were shouting. Around that same time, Kim All called 911 from her home a few blocks away from the chaotic scene at the club. The, the dog's barking woke me up. And uh, so when I went to investigate, I could only hear people talking. I couldn't um, see anything. Um, and then as I was looking out the front window, three people came walking out from between my neighbor's house and my house. So they had obviously been in the side yard or the backyard, which wasn't secure at the time. And uh, they just stood there looking out at the street. Um, and never looking back that my dogs were still barking. And when my dogs quieted, um, I decided to call the police. Back at the club, Constable Roche was tasked with transporting two Stamps players, including Derek Dennis, to police headquarters, where they could provide witness statements. They're, they're so upset and they're, and they're just kind of going over like what a what a good guy Mylan was and they can't believe that this happened and then all of a sudden so I'd gone maybe four blocks is all and all of a sudden Derek is right behind me on the bench and he kind of like leans forward he has this like huge powerful voice he's just like that's the shooter and he points and yells and I see this group of men just kind of walking onto the sidewalk I saw them just walking down the street and I like, it like caught me off guard at first. I'm like, I'm like, there's no way these dudes are that stupid to just be walking down the street a block away from where they just shot somebody. And um, I remember seeing them and I recognized them by their, by their clothing because it was dark. But I remember I saw the tall dude. He had a red vest on and a white shirt. He had red pants on. The vest was gone. He just had the white shirt and the red pants. I saw the other dude who had the Marnie, the Marnie Exchange had that mess of took off. He had took his hat off and he had like tossed it. 
he was still wearing the shirt that he was wearing in the club. And I seen the other guy who, um, who did it. He uh, took his hat off, tossed it. He just had his shirt on. So in my head, I'm going, you know, that's, I go to the officer, I go, that's them right there. He goes, that's who? So the guy who shot him is right there. Like he's walking down the street. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm absolutely positive that it's them right there. Roche and his partner got on their radio and requested backup. And right away, two patrol cars got, like, from the scene, got to 42nd. And so the two cars pull up like this. The doors are open, the overhead lights are on, and we see them challenge this, these individuals. We see them put, putting their hands up, turning around. They're taking them into, police are taking them into custody, and... As this has happened, Derek is like, right, he's leaning kind of between the seats and he's like, that guy there that they're taking, he's the one that started the argument. And they're like, that guy, he's the shooter. And he's, we're kind of getting like real time information as um, they're taking them into custody. And I'd never like seen something like that before. Bro, I'll never forget their faces ever again in life. Like there's never a time where I'll never not recognize them. And I just, you know, I told the cops, they arrested them and then um, that's, that's how they caught him. Less than a half hour after the shooting, three people were identified by Derek Dennis and taken into custody for questioning. Minutes later, Mylon Hicks died in hospital. Sean Gregson is a staff sergeant with the Calgary Police Service now, but in September of 2016, he was a detective with the Homicide Unit and became the primary investigator in this case. The fact that we got them in custody so quickly gives us another advantage when it comes to forensics. We've got all the same clothing, the identification. They're transported back to our headquarters. Um, I've also contacted somebody from our crime scenes unit to come in, photograph, seize all the clothing, and swab our suspects down for gunshot residue. Once a suspect's been arrested, police have 24 hours to either proceed with charges or let them go. In this case, investigators focused on finding any surveillance video that may have captured the shooting. The main camera right outside the front doors, which is where this incident took place, those ones weren't working. That would have been a critical piece of evidence that would have been outstanding for court, but We have pieces of video that show the suspects and the players, everybody that was there throughout the night, but that critical piece was missing. Police later received a call from a local cab driver who happened to be in the parking lot when the shots were fired. One of the cabs we we weren't even aware was there. It was, thankfully they contacted us and said, I might have something that you guys need. In analyzing that video, we actually catch a glimpse of the suspect running with what clearly looks like a handgun in his hand back to the vehicle. The vehicle pulling right right in front of the cab and then leaving the scene of the murder. Remember, Kim All called 911 and reported hearing suspicious activity in her neighborhood a few blocks from the club. Nearby, patrol officers found a van that matched the description of the one the suspects fled the scene in. Investigators scoured the area for evidence Here's veteran homicide detective Ken Carrier. I ended up taking a number of different routes. I did walk the area a couple of different times, um, but it was parked, the vehicle was parked, would have been parked right next to an, an alley near Stanley Place, Stanley Drive. I subsequently walked that alley, and as I started walking it, I could see that there was footprints in the mud uh, that walked towards McLeod Trail. I then to take myself out of contaminating any evidence, started walking on the grass. He checked the bins in that alley in case any evidence had been discarded. One of them, uh, which was a recycling bin, I flipped open and the very top was a lighting box uh, for a light fixture. So I jostled the box just with my finger because you don't want to touch it too much in case it is evidence. I jostled it with my finger and could feel the weight within the box. I kind of took my light, looked down at an angle, and sure enough, I can see the ribbing on what I would consider the slide of the gun. The crime scenes unit was called in, 
Here again is Staff Sergeant Gregson. That gun was sent away for analysis to our firearms experts. They did the testing and determined that that was an exact match for the rounds that were uh, located at the scene, the casings that were found at the scene, and the, me- the weapon used to in the murder. That recycle bin was behind Kimal's neighbor's home. It's one of those times when if something just doesn't sit with you, it's like don't ever hesitate to call the police because that was a critical piece. We located the vehicle, we located the gun, all because of a suspicious person in your backyard. As the clock ticked towards that 24-hour mark and the decision to release or charge the suspects, police were learning more about the three men. The primary suspect was 19-year-old Nelson Lugella. Once the investigation um, unfolded and we re- ultimately found out who he really was, uh, we knew he was well known to um, the Calgary police. Lugella faced several charges in 2016 prior to the shooting. All were either stayed or withdrawn. Derek Dennis saw the shooting happen right in front of him. Police said his description of the gunman matched Lugella. The other two men questioned by police also matched Dennis's witness account. Here's the deputy chief prosecutor in Calgary, Gord Haight. A young man by the name of Darwin Concepcion, I think he was only 18 at the time. He uh, was previous acquaintances with uh, Mr. Lagella and a third individual by the name of Mr. Mohammed. He knew them from school. That summer, he had got reacquainted with the three of them and they were hanging out that night going, looking for a place to party and they eventually ended up in the uh, Marquee Lounge. Darwin Concepcion was the only one to cooperate with police that night. Mr. Concepcion then Um, after giving a very lengthy recorded statement to the police, while he's still in custody, um, participated in somewhat of a a recreation of, of what occurred immediately after that shooting. Investigators said his version of events matched witness accounts. Police also showed Derek Dennis a photo lineup. He picked out Nelson Lugella and told investigators that was the man who shot his teammate. I just remember just, you know, going, being in a police station all night and just them asking me a million and one questions and I'm answering the questions, but I'm asking them one solid question and they just refused to answer it. And it was, it was, is he okay? Like, is he alive? Is he okay? I mean, I think it was like right at the end, right before I left, they finally told me like, yeah, man, you know, when I was in the interrogation room, just kind of giving them everything. And they kind of just was like, yeah, your friend didn't make it. And I just, I just remember breaking down, like just crying. Lugella was charged with the second degree murder of Mylon Hicks. The other two men were released. Miles away in Michigan, Mylon's mother had no idea her son was gone. It was the wee hours of the morning. I managed to get to sleep, and then I got a text message from a friend, and she said through the text, she says, do you need me to go to your house? And so I looked at the text, and I rolled back over. But when I rolled back over, it was just a little nudge on me to, to call her. So I leaned over, and I got out my phone. I called her. She said Mylon had been hurt and then later passed. And I said, are you sure you're talking about the right guy? I said, Mylon's not even in Detroit. And she said, yeah, it's on the news, Renee. But at the same time she was saying it was on the news, my husband's phone was ringing and the people were informing him. But the government from Canada had already got in touch with the government here, unbeknownst to me, and they had already been out to my house knocked on the door and told his sister, my daughter, and they were preparing how they could tell me. I didn't believe it. Sometimes I still don't, but I know it's true. But um, yeah, it took me by surprise. Cause again, Mylon wasn't here. If something was gonna happen, really, crime wise, I just said, it's our streets, yeah. But the devil is everywhere. 
Lawrence Thomas fell asleep soon after he got the photo of Mylan at the club. That was his last message. He woke up to a call from his old high school coach. He was crying and like my heart just dropped. Like, hold on, what's going on? Like, what's going on? And he had said like, Mylan just, just been killed. And I'm like, ain't no way. He just, I just seen, like, I just woke up out of my sleep a couple hours ago and seen that he sent me a Snapchat. And I'm saying, like, uh, everything is fine. And he was like, no, that's what, that's when it happened. Like, it happened, like, after the club. So once he told me that, like, I hung the phone up. I believe I searched, like, on Twitter, like, his name, like, Mylon Hicks. And it said, like, Mylon Hicks in a nightclub shooting in Calgary. So it was like, I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It was like a nightmare. Mylan's friends and family couldn't believe he was gone. His parents rushed to get a flight to Calgary. I came immediately. I think it took two days. Uh, they expedited my passport, and I was able to get there. And I was met uh, at the airport by, uh, I guess, someone from the team, as well as a, um, a barrage of reporters. And um, they didn't know Mylan at that time, other than just being... Um, a stamp player. Then they began to dig a little deeper into his history, found out the outstanding top rank young man he was. And I believe that's when it began to hit others, strangers. Because everywhere we walked, I had people just reaching out to me there on the streets of a, of a different country, crying out for Mylan Hicks. Mylan's parents met with the stamps. So God strengthened me, and I know it was nobody but him because my knees were buckling. And I, I began to give out, and God just stood me up and said, this is what I want you to tell them. Tell them that there's a God. Some of them know, some of them don't. Tell them about me. Use this opportunity. Give me the glory. I just kept hearing that over and over in my head, and in spite of all my pain, I still went out there and did exactly what God would have me to do. Derek Dennis being one, he said to me, and I hate to repeat it, he said, I was there. I remember him saying that to me. He said he was scared. And I looked at him and I asked him who was scared. He said, Mylon. I said, never that. And I put my face against his because I didn't want to hear no more. And I began to just talk to him. I didn't want to hear anything else. The team was reeling. Yeah, I mean, we just kind of dedicated the rest of the season to Milan, man. We just wanted to make him proud. We knew how much he wanted to win, how much, you know, he cared about the game. I kind of made a vow to myself to try to play a game with the same, you know, speed and, and ferocity that he played it with, man. Because when Milan put on the helmet and shoulder pads, man, it's just, you just... You could tell it was somebody doing something that they loved, that they cared about. One week after Mylan was killed, Stamps coach Dave Dickinson spoke to players in the locker room before their first game back. And guys, for Mylan, hit the on button. I heard you guys say it. He had an on button. Go hit the on button, and it's game time. Family on three. One, two, three. Family. In December of 2018, Nelson Lugella stood trial for the second-degree murder of Mylan Hicks. Prosecutor Gord Haight painted a picture of the shooting for the court. There were two shots. Um, one of them hit Mr. Hicks mortally. It was at the front, somewhat at the front of his torso. But as he was running away, he was turning around, trying to see his pursuer, and it, presumably as he's turning around, as he's running away, that's when the shot hits him. Mr. Hicks falls in the parking lot um, and ultimately dies in hospital. Derek Dennis was a key witness. Mr. Dennis clearly had an eye for detail. He described the gun, which ultimately was discovered. He accurately described what all three uh, looked like in terms of their... Uh, apparent ethnicity, uh, the, the, the darkness of their skin, uh, their relative heights to each other, what they were all wearing. All of that was bang on. CCTV evidence shown in court backed Derek Dennis's eyewitness account. 
a video inside the bar at the entrance area as the patrons come in and leave. That showed in pretty uh, impressive detail the accused, Mr. Concepcion, Mr. Muhammad, enter the bar and the three of them leave the bar. It, they were clearly uh, um, identifiable on that videotape. Through the dash cam videos of these taxi cabs, you could, number one, hear the shooting. You could hear the shots. There were two of them. And you could also see the immediate aftermath. So you see Mr. Concepcion move to the north from the front of the building towards Mr. Lugella, beckon him, as seen by Mr. Dennis, come on, let's go. And then the two of them leave in a hurry and get into Mr. Concepcion's motor vehicle. The footage was somewhat grainy, uh, so it wasn't crystal clear, but it was certainly shaped like a gun in his hand. And the one video still, which uh, um, was marked into evidence, saw you see the gun against Mr. Lugella's white shirt, uh, silhouetted against his white shirt. And really there wasn't much doubt that it, um, that was a gun that he was holding. Darwin Concepcion also testified against his friend Lugella. He didn't see the shooting, uh, but he certainly heard it and was in his the driver's seat of his motor vehicle when Mr. Muhammad and Mr. Lugella came back in an awful hurry and told him to leave. He noticed that Mr. Lugella was handling this gun. He had this gun in his hand. And Mr. Lugella said words to them effect of, I shot two, I don't think he's going to make it. Mr. Conce Mr. Concepcion was uh, somewhat freaked out at this point in time. He parked his vehicle. He, the three of them, I think, were panicking. They left the vehicle with uh, Mr. Uh, Mohammed's red vest still within the vehicle, uh, with Mr. Concepcion's hat still in the vehicle, um, and made their way through a back alley, at which point Mr. Concepcion says he saw Mr. Lugella dispose of the gun in a blue recycle bin. That gun was subsequently recovered by the police. They then made their way down uh, uh, sort of a back rickety area of stairs back onto McLeod Trail. And as they were going along McLeod Trail, that's when Mr. Dennis spied them as he was being transported to give a statement. And it was then that Mr. Dennis very excitedly stated, that's the shooter pointing at Mr. Lugella. Mylan's mother attended the court proceedings. I recall running out a couple of times um, running out in anger, running out in pain. And so I really had to pray hard. I carried my Bible. I, I, I asked the Lord to help me with that because you hurt my baby. Nelson Lugella was found guilty of second degree murder. This uh, case was successfully prosecuted uh, mainly as a result of the very thorough investigation uh, conducted by the Calgary Police Service and the really solid witnesses, uh, in particular, Mr. Dennis. At the sentencing hearing, Mylan's mother read a victim impact statement in court. Very senseless. I conveyed that to the courts and, and the killer, um, that this was senseless. And I, I recall telling the killer that you'll never be free what was the odds that my son would come to Canada and run into the devil himself? I always ask that question, that he would just go meet Lucifer in the flesh. Nelson Lugella was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 18 years. The events of that fateful night replay over and over for Mylan's mother. I think he let his guard down somewhat because he was in Canada and every perception was that it was safe, that you don't have to actually look over your shoulders. You could go and just wander and no one's gonna bother you, you know? Your money was gonna stay in your pocket. You could let your fists unclench because you were pretty much safe and it was just a, it was just a facade. 
He was caught blindsided there. Every day, Mylan is missed and remembered. I'm lonely. Mylan was my friend. I wrestle every day. Every day, not a day passes. I wrestle every day. But again, I got a lot of faith, so it helps aid me. I just know this was a major loss, not just to me, but to family and to friends, to the community, to even the football league. Mylan just was an outstanding character, and I'm, and I'm not saying this as it relates to being biased. I'm telling you what God loves, the truth. He was just was an outstanding person. So many of Mylan's friends and family spoke to me for this episode. So I want to take time now to give them a voice. He was a great person. Like, he touched so many souls. He touched so many hearts. And his name alone is going to keep living on forever because of the person he was. You know what I'm saying? He was loyal, strong, funny, caring. He was he was family oriented. Um, you know, he everything was about the family. Everything he did was to better his family, to put us in a better position. You know, to take us from where we was and you know put us in a better place. Uh, you know, to know him is to love him. Like, I, I don't know anybody who's ever met him and, you know, didn't like him or, you know, disliked him in any way. Even if they wanted to, you know, they ended up, you know, being his friend or just, you know, having genuine love for him. He was a lovable guy. I never cried so hard in my life. Like, it changed me. I'm not even the same person. If you ride in the car with Milo and you're in a passenger seat, he like an extra seat belt. He just moves so different. Like, everybody I talk to, like, if I could just be half of the man he was, I'd be all right. It's something that you will never get over when you have a, a friendship that's so dynamic and to lose it in the blink of an eye, it can never be replaced. You will never find a friend, a companion, a brother like Mylan. He was a very bright light, and if, to be honest, if my children can be an ounce of what Mylon was to the community, to his family, then I've done my part as a mother. The 2015-2016 season was supposed to be a historic season for the Stamps. Instead, it was memorable for all the wrong reasons. You know, we just try to go out there and just play the game of football with the same with the same umph for Milan, man. And that's that's what we did, man. We kind of steamrolled through everybody until we got to to the Great Cup, and you know, Milan's mom was there and having her on the sideline and being there and you know, seeing her before the game, and you know, it, it, it kills me to this day how we didn't win that Great Cup, man, because we wanted to give her a ring, we wanted to send her home with, with some memento with Milan's name on it, so that she knew that he was a part of something that was greater than him. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of kills me that we didn't get it done, man. So, uh, but yeah, I was, that was that was just it. You know, we just we just tried to power through it, man, as best we could and just try to remember him as best we could by playing the game that he loved the same way he played it. Two years later, in 2018, the Stampeders finally won and many of the players dedicated the win to Milan. Crime Beat is written and produced by me, Nancy Hickst, with producer Dila Velasquez. Audio editing and sound design is by Rob Johnston. Special thanks to photographer-editor Danny Lantella for his work on this episode. And thanks to Chris Bassett, the acting VP of National and Network News for Global News. I would also like to thank the Michigan State Spartans Sports Network for the clip of Mylan we shared with you. And a special thanks to TSN for their help with this episode. I would love to have you tell a friend about this podcast, and you can help me share these important stories by rating and reviewing Crime Beat on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can find me on Twitter at Nancy Hickst, on Facebook at Nancy Hickst Crime Beat, and I'd love to have you join me 
on Instagram at nancy.hixt. That's N-A-N-C-Y dot H-I-X-T. Thanks again for listening. Please join me next time.